This is Tall Tale TV, your podcast for sci-fi and fantasy short stories. This audiobook will be published in three parts. To listen to all the parts in one place, please visit talltaletv.com slash series. Part 1 of 3 Deliverance Written by Hunter Blaine Narrated by Chris Heron Chapter 1 Houston, 1990 Frantic footsteps echo down the dark alley, accompanied by labored breaths of panic. The would-be rapist's feet worked faster than his reeling mind, and he stepped into a puddle that hit a deep pothole. Trembling hands shot out to cushion my dinner's fall, but slipped on the wet concrete. I let out an eerie giggle that reverberated off the stone walls as I dramatically skipped like a theater student, trying out for the role of the playful Victorian girl, overdoing it as much as possible. My eyes glowed a fierce red as I smiled, baring teeth with two elongated canines. Long hair whipped around my head as I skipped, a few times getting into my eyes and prompting a quick swipe of my hand. I did so enjoy living in a densely populated city like Houston. It afforded me with hunting grounds ripe for the picking. Whenever I was hungry, all I had to do was lurk in the shadows around high-crime neighborhoods and just wait. This night, my preternatural ears had picked up the cries of a young Latina woman whose only crime had been walking on the sidewalk in a bad part of town after sunset. Following the screams, which had been ignored by the mortals living in the area, I had come upon the crime in progress. The rapist had been tearing at the young lady's fast food uniform, which had a white plastic name tag with the name Anna stenciled upon it. Two glowing rubies emerging from the shadows had made Anna stop screaming, which had caught the attention of her attacker. His hungry eyes had lifted from her exposed skin to see a face stunned in disbelief. Following her unbelieving gaze, the rapist had turned his head to bear witness to the consequences of his life choices. Without waiting for orders from the brain, his legs began pumping in an attempt to flee his fate before plunging into that very fateful pothole. The rapist quickly rolled onto his back, attempting to crab walk away while whimpering, No, please, don't hurt me, and slipping hysterically on the wet pavement, when just minutes ago his role had been the reverse, and he hadn't listened to Anna. I leapt into the air, my black World War II trench coat billowing as I majestically soared and landed on top of the naughty man. Black, steel-toed Doc Martens crunched delicate parts between boot and concrete. The rapist's eyes bulged to the point I thought they were about to burst from their sockets like champagne corks. He inhaled sharply, his throat whistling loud enough that I thought a train was about to come barreling out of his agony-stricken face. I twisted my feet before lifting my boots off his hard-boiled eggs, which were now scrambled with a split sausage to complete the ensemble. I stepped to either side of his writhing torso while blood rushed to escape its phallic prison, staining his blue jeans a satisfying karmic crimson. It was then that the once rapist finished sucking in all the air into his lungs, unleashing a high-pitched scream that would probably be heard from the moon. At least, he would have, if not for the swift punch to his chest that fractured his sternum like a windshield after a hailstorm. Accumulated air rushed out in a single shotgun blast, making my black hair blow back ever so slightly. His breath smelled of alcohol, cigarettes, and bad decisions. As veins bulged and capillaries broke in the no-longer-a-rapist's face, I leaned down until we were nose-to-nose. -nose. As he stared wide-eyed into my glowing ruby pupils, I whispered, What did the vampire say to the whimpering blood bank? He answered with wordless squeaks as his gaping mouth tried desperately to suck air into his collapsed lungs. I moved my mouth closer to his ear and answered the question for him. I'd like to make a withdrawal. As I spoke, I willed my blood to ooze out of my palm and coagulate into a razor-sharp dagger, which I plunged into the thug's blood-soaked liver. As my manifestation pierced his flesh, I began to exsanguinate him, taking the crimson life energy into my being. 
I moaned in pure elation as his blood flowed through my veins, tickling every nerve in my body like a lover running their fingers lightly across my skin. Over my entire being, hairs stood on end as wave after wave of unimaginable pleasure coursed through my eager flesh. My eyes rolled back into my head as my mouth hung agape in ecstasy. His heart began to flutter erratically as his blood tank went steadily from full to empty, relinquishing every last drop to its new master. As the final drop crossed the threshold, I slid my blood dagger out of his shriveled liver and willed the manifestation to retreat back into my hand. Red eyes shifted to a brilliant purple, the color of sunset, as long fangs retracted, falling back in line. I stood, feeling the cold night air caress my skin, which was warm from the fresh kill. With perfect comedic prowess, I burped before covering my mouth and exclaiming with wide eyes, "'Excuse me!' to the empty alley. "'Must have been something I ate,' I said to myself as I reached down and grabbed the husk of a corpse by the belt. Looking up at the roofline of one of the buildings we were between, I jumped up with ease to land on the ledge, some twenty feet above the ground. I scanned the horizon, found the landmarks I was searching for, bent at the knees, and launched into the darkness. We soared over several buildings, my coat flapping in the wind, sounding like a diesel engine. My cargo lost a shoe in mid-flight, which made me smile for some reason. A building rushed up to meet us, and I landed in a crouch, only to explode into the night again. In short order, I arrived at my destination on the eastern edge of the city, a wide, calm river surrounded by nature, hungrily awaiting its prize. I walked to the edge of the embankment, lifted my offering, and tore a limb from the torso. I whistled a few times, as if summoning a loyal dog, and threw an arm into the murky water. Within moments, a log emerged from the shadows and burst from the water long enough to grab the limb between its prehistoric jaws before disappearing into the inky depths. A smile tugged at the corners of my mouth. I tore another piece of meat from its socket and tossed it in, whistling a staccato to signal mealtime. Several more alligators cruised over to the floating protein and began fighting over the morsel. <laughs> Whoa there, fellas. I brought enough for all of you. I exclaimed delightedly as I began tearing chunks of white and pink flesh, tossing them into the bubbling fray. It was a darkly humorous twist on old people feeding bread to ducks. As I threw the shoeless foot into the water, a smaller evidence-destroying machine came up and jerked the meal under the surface. My slight smile became a full, toothy grin as the ripples on the water expanded outward, only to diminish and become calm again. I was proud of my gator babies, and I felt like I was making the world a better place, one meal at a time. Crickets chirped in chorus to the peaceful sound of the gentle, glass-top water as it flowed. A bright moon illuminated the grass I knew to be green, though it was hard to distinguish without man-made lighting or my preternatural eyes. When in full predator mode, I could see in the darkness as if it were the brightest day. The wind tugged at my coat and exposed shoulder-length black hair, blowing the loose strands over my face. A hand absent-mindedly brushed the hair out of my eyes and back around my ears. Having preternatural hair I could never cut was tedious at times. Even if I buzzed it down to my skin, it would just instantly slither out of my skull like a Play-Doh toy and continue its eternal war with the wind. Job done, I moved my consciousness from behind my eyes and into the control room of my mind. My exact copy stood with one hand on the steering wheel, standing in the center of the room. One of my own hands rested on it as well, signifying a harmonious split between my predatory self and my, um, self-self. Predatory self, or P.S., as I uncreatively called him, was my exact clone, with a few distinct differences. His eyes were permanently red, and his skin was darker, as if perpetually cast in shadow. He didn't speak much, or at all. We communicated through a series of nods and me yelling at him. 
P.S. was the personification of my vampire instincts, desires, and undeniable need to feed. I wasn't entirely sure if he was a machination my mind had created after I had been given the dark gift by Ulrich in 1480, or if he was a metaphysical being bestowed upon me when I had drunk my maker's blood all those centuries ago. P.S. and I had a give-and-take relationship. If I gave him too much control over my body, he would take everything he wanted without pausing to consider the consequences. I was ashamed to admit that he had taken full control more than a few times, with me barely getting the wheel back before irreparable damage had been done. That being said, he had also saved my bootylicious body countless times over the past five hundred years. When P.S. had full control of the wheel, which, fun fact, had once been Reigns long ago, he was an unstoppable killing machine. Because of the vampire doppelganger dwelling in my mind, we had defeated the likes of horrifying demons, vicious fae, and even a vengeful ancient god or two. I nodded at P.S., who began loosening his grip on the wheel, releasing control back to... A blast of white, blue, and red fire enveloped me like a tidal wave. P.S. shoved me off the wheel as I stood frozen in flaming agony. My hair flared and disintegrated in an instant as the flames ate at my unprotected head, melting my skin with alarming efficiency. With P.S. in full control of my body, I dove headfirst into the murky water, extinguishing the flames. My body was racked with pain, as if every nerve in my exposed skin had been attached to a generator powerful enough to run all of Houston. Heal! I cried out to P.S. as I writhed in agony inside my mind. I forced myself to look at P.S. as he concentrated on healing the burns that brought about impossible amounts of pain. Turning to me, he shook his head frantically, signaling he couldn't heal the wounds from the flames. Heaven fire! I screamed through gritted teeth as the realization struck. P.S. nodded determinedly and looked back at the windows that were my eyes, falling back into consciousness. I looked through the control room's eyes and became a passenger in my own body, racked with burning anguish. Somehow, I was always the one who experienced the pain, though we both received the elation when feeding. Explain to me how that's fair. I'll wait. I moved underwater until my feet touched the bottom, and I sent my senses out all around me. I felt my eyes shift and fangs elongate in reaction to P.S. taking control. Within seconds, I'd found my attacker. The heat signature stood out even through the silt-filled water because I was seeing it through my preternatural senses, not simply my eyes. While still underwater, I positioned myself facing my target, extending my arms to either side, and brought my hands together in a wide clap that created a sonic boom. A tsunami of brown water, fifteen feet tall, rushed from the river and up the bank, with me running right behind it. Through the massive wave, I could see the red outline of my attacker move his hands in front of him, one hand circling the other clockwise. As the wall approached, he brought his hands into his stomach and then shot them out in front of his body. Jump! I yelled in my head, which P.S. obliged to. A wedge of invisible force cut through the water, creating a space wide enough for the skilled man to pass unharmed. The water fell around my attacker as his head swiveled to search for me. I was vaguely aware that the trees across the river were crashing to the ground from where they had been decimated by the spell. At the crest of my leap, I wheeled a blood longsword out of my palm and held it with both hands, ready to bring it down on my target's head. As I came within spitting distance, I brought the manifestation down in a vicious strike that would have cleaved entire city buses in half with ease. I pulled my lips back in a shark's grin and realized my skin was still melting off my skull, exposing muscle and bone. This didn't phase P.S., who was in complete control at the moment, and right now, I wasn't complaining. I wanted him to have a clear head while attacking. The mage, paladin, or warlock, or whatever the fuck he was that could use holy magic, simply lifted his arm and uttered a quick word. 
blinding white light shot down the length of his arm, intercepting my blade and shattering it, like the ice sculpture that had been knocked to the ground at the wedding of that friend whom you were no longer allowed to see again because his wife was mad you had ruined her day, or something like that. As the energy I had used to create the blade was destroyed, P.S. and I were both hit with white-hot sheets of pain that completely stunned us. Physical pain was one thing, but not even P.S. could ignore the devastation that was the loss of life energy that we put into our manifestations. I fell limply to the ground, muscles frozen in shock as our attacker looked down on us. He was a priest, complete with black robes and the white collar thingy that told everyone how much better than you they were. I liked him immediately for some reason. He kicked me onto my back and extended an open hand towards my chest. An unseen elephant sat on my torso, pinning my arms and legs to the ground. Struggle as I might, I couldn't free myself. I was vaguely aware that the skin on my skull had stopped melting. When? The priest began chanting, and I looked up to fully see his face. He was in his mid-forties and had salt and pepper hair that teased receding and sat above a worn face. He had both smile and frown lines etched into his features. Brown eyes scowled from beneath bushy eyebrows, regarding me with professional disdain. Oh, fuck! He's gonna exercise us! I screeched on the precipice of losing my shit. Does that even work on vampires? P.S. slapped my face and pointed at his temple forcefully. Right! I started, willing myself to calm the fuck down. Think! Use my big ol' sexy brain! Um, what about if we... Without warning, my skin started to heat up all over my body, to the point of becoming extremely alarming. The sensation sped past uncomfortable at relativistic speeds and landed on excruciating without even the tiniest bit of foreplay. P.S. did something then that I had rarely seen in all our time together. He began squirming with pain plastered on his face. The cords on his neck stood out as his eyes bulged. It was my body being exercised, but both of our immortal essences, which were permanently intertwined, were being attacked. I tried to scream, but I couldn't get any air into my lungs with the invisible aircraft carrier sitting on my chest. Luckily, I didn't need to breathe in order to live. But, like most things, I did need to not conflagrate in order to survive. P.S. slapped me again and aggressively tapped his temple in pained agitation. Through a clenched jaw, I screamed, I know! I know! Think! I let my mind flow free, and I latched on to the first thought that came to me, like a kung fu master snatching a fly out of the air with chopsticks. If I was being honest with myself, it had been more like reaching into a raging river made entirely of salmon, missing every grab, falling in, and then climbing back out to see that one of the fishes had landed on the bank in sheer luck. P.S. took one hand off the wheel, and I took hold throwing my consciousness back into the driver's seat with P.S. sitting next to me. As my skin began to bubble, I concentrated on the hand closest to the priest. A blood snake slithered out and inched forward, low to the ground. Once it reached his feet, it began circling the priest's perimeter until it had wrapped around in a circle a few times. I willed the blood snake to jump up, coil around the priest's legs, and tighten with preternatural speed. My attacker lost his balance as his legs were slammed together, forcing his concentration and chanting to drop as well. The invisible moon that had sat on me was lifted, and I slammed my elbows into the ground, springing myself to my feet in a blur. I grabbed the priest's elbows and sent out another blood snake to wrap around his torso, pinning his arms to his sides. My skin stopped bubbling, and I took a brief moment to assess my injuries before dealing with this holy do-gooder. As I looked down at my body, searching for any additional damage, the priest started whispering. Warmth spread over my skin again and started growing in intensity. My eyes shot from my blistered body to the priest's eyes. I tisk-tisked at him like a parent who had caught his kid's hand in the cookie jar. To shut him up, I willed one of the snake's heads to slither up his chest and into his mouth. Relief washed over me when his jaw stopped moving. 
Not only because I was annoyed by him, but also for the fact that he had nearly boiled me alive in my own skin using his stupid holy magic. Who the fuck are you? I asked between heaving breaths of anger interlaced with exhaustion. The priest answered with a mumble. Oh, right, I said as I willed the snake's head to retreat just outside of his mouth. Try anything, and I'll make the snake go all the way through until it hits moonlight. Do you understand me? I enunciated each word in the last sentence aggressively, letting my red eyes glow brighter in warning. I understand, my son, the priest said, all too calmly, prompting an eyebrow to climb up my face. Dude, I'm over five hundred years old. Don't call me son, I instructed, annoyed. Simply a term of endearment, Jonathan. It's John, and I don't give a fuck. Wait, how the hell do you know my name, holy man? My face contorted into a scowl as a seed of unease planted itself in my chest. P.S. attempted to nudge me off the wheel and began squeezing the snakes still wrapped around the mortal priest. The human groaned in protest as I looked at P.S. inside my mind and said, Dude, what are you doing? He's not a threat anymore. Predatory self ignored the question and leaned forward, baring my teeth in a sneer of unbridled rage. P.S. He's an innocent. He's a fucking priest for Lila's sake. I yelled at him. Then I changed tactics. He can't hurt us anymore, man. Ease up and let's get some answers. Okay? P.S. gave me a cursory glance before yanking his hands off the wheel in frustration and walking away to sulk in a corner of my mind. Grabbing the wheel, I took full control of my body and loosened my grip on the priest. Sorry about that, I said, slightly embarrassed. I found it odd that I remotely cared what this mortal thought. Maybe it was my Irish Catholic upbringing that instilled a sense of respect for priests. The priest stared at me in wonder before he said, I had heard there was a vampire that wrestled with his infernal tendencies, and here you are. Who told? I asked. I didn't mind others knowing I tried my darndest to use my special set of skills to hurt bad guys, but how the hell had a priest caught wind? Was it that big of a deal? All it takes is an open mind and the right contacts, the priest said all too calmly and with emphasis on the last word. Who are you? I asked, pulling him closer and peering at him, using all my preternatural senses. He was just a mortal man that had an aura of what I assumed to be holy essence. My name is Father Thomas Philseep, and I'm a warrior for the light. His steady heartbeat tugged at my attention like a child pulling on his parent's pant leg. Flies that were stuck in my web usually weren't this calm. It was unnerving. I peered closer at the man. I hesitantly asked, You could get out of this if you wanted to, couldn't you, father? Would it make you feel better if I did not answer that question? His tranquil heartbeat told me all I needed to know. With a sigh of weariness, I released the blood snakes and let them retract back into my palms. If he could escape from my manifestations and had not yet done so, then there was a purpose for his visit. Father Thomas casually brushed his black robes before straightening his collar. Then he looked me straight in the eyes. He smiled, extended his hand, and said, It's a pleasure to meet you, my son. I've been looking for someone like you for many years. I hesitantly extended my hand, grabbing his firmly without being overbearing, and shook it. It had bothered me less that he had referred to me as his son, like I was already part of his flock. Cook. John Cook. So I've been told, Father Thomas said, while maintaining his smile and returning the firmness of the handshake. The hint was subtle. Yeah, so purely out of curiosity, who flapped their jaws and spilled the beans? I asked, releasing my grip and dropping my hand to my side. You will find that I am resourceful, John Cook. Okay, then, I said, somewhat annoyed. 
What did you mean by looking for someone like me? I was told there was a vampire that wanted to perform good deeds with his unholy powers. Though I attacked you first, I am still here, alive and well. For all I knew, you could have ended my life once defeated. Why didn't you? He tilted his head as he spoke, curious to my answer. No, uh, because I didn't want to hurt an innocent, I stammered. You'll find that honesty is the key to opening the door of trust, my son, Father Thomas said patiently before asking again. Why do you want to fight your vampiric nature and do righteous deeds? I looked at the ground and thought about what he had said. Honesty is the key. Maybe I should start being honest with myself. Ah, uh, I don't want to go to hell, father, I said, just above a whisper while keeping my unfocused gaze on the ground, unable to look him in the eyes. The words were heavy as they came out, leaving behind a lump in my throat. I had answered a tremendous question that I had never truly asked myself before. You think doing good deeds will erase your past transgressions against God's children? Though the words themselves were harsh, there was no judgment in the question, only legitimate curiosity. My mind flashed with countless vivid memories, like a flipbook that was a mile long. Each page of the thick, flowing tome showed inexcusable horrors I had personally committed over the centuries. As the years had gone by, I had begun disguising each deed as an excuse to protect the innocent. If I were to look into a mirror, would I be able to convince the man looking back at me that I wasn't a monster who killed for sport as much for saving the innocent? I struggled to raise my gaze, which was weighed down with all my accumulated indiscretions over the last five hundred years. I looked the holy man before me in the eyes. I don't know. Tears blurred my vision with the sudden realization that my soiled soul had probably been submerged deeper into the sludge of my misguided actions. Faced with the literal embodiment of God's judgment, I could no longer fool myself. I felt vulnerable for the first time in ages. It felt oddly freeing, like breaking a fractured bone after it had healed the wrong way. It was painful to expose my fractured heart to this mortal and myself but I knew it would allow me the opportunity to set my broken soul right and heal. It was time to take responsibility for my actions. Can you help me? I asked as the tears freed themselves, running down my cheeks to disappear in the thickness of my reddish beard. It felt amazing to have this weight lifted off my chest. I couldn't explain why, but I felt like this man before me was of significant importance for my eternal soul. Perhaps, Father Thomas said contemplatively, I am not sure how others in the church would feel about an alliance with a vampire. I could feel my only chance at salvation slipping away, like sand between my fingers. What if we didn't tell them? I asked, knowing it was a stupid question to ask a man of God. Are you suggesting that I lie via omission to the church? Father Thomas asked with squinting eyes. Honesty, honesty, honesty. I set my jaws as I doubled down as I said, Yes, I am, Father. Father Thomas responded by grunting, looking away and placing a hand on his chin in thought. Think of all we could accomplish, I said with building excitement, Without telling my hand to do so, I instinctively wiped the tear tracks under both my eyes. The time for self-loathing was over. You have your connections, I said with emphasis on the last word, just as he had done. And I have my abilities. I stuck out my chest and raised my chin. I want to help you defeat evil. Father Thomas looked at me now, letting his hand drop from his chin. 
even if it means killing others of your kind, not just vampires, mind you, but anyone I deem a threat to the light? First, I'm pretty damn sure there aren't any vampires left. And second, if you can help me cleanse my soul and get into heaven, then hell yes I'm in. A single eyebrow lifted on Father Thomas's aging face. Sorry, heck, I meant heck yes, not that other thing I said. If you don't mind my asking, he prompted, why does an immortal fear what happens in the afterlife? That question hit hard, and I was slightly rocked back as if struck by a surprising rogue wind. I knew the answer in my heart, but had never told a mortal about what had happened to me that night. Heck, I could count on one hand how many of my closest friends I had told, and still have enough fingers left to flip someone off with the added thumb. Inhaling deeply, I said, I've seen the afterlife, Padre. His face remained expressionless, signaling for me to continue. I was in my early twenties, and living on the farm with my family. Long story short, they were executed, and I was next. My maker found me in a prison, and offered me the chance to avenge them. In my grief and rage, I agreed. He killed me then, and my soul shot out into the universe, toward a bright light. That's when my maker spilled his blood into my all but lifeless mouth, and delivered to me my dark gift. I watched as my soul was changed into what I am today, and it hurt, father. It hurt more than words can ever possibly convey, so I know the soul can feel pain. So forgive me if I don't want to spend an eternity in hell, where pain is prevalent. I've come close enough to death to know I won't live forever. A solar flare will fry the earth, or man will turn this world into cinders over whose god is the best. It doesn't matter how the end will come, but I know it will come someday, and I would like to see my family again when I take the big sleep. I was breathing heavily as I told my story. The worry that was always tingling in the back of my mind had sprung forth to deliver lightning bolts of crippling anxiety and existential fear. Thank you for sharing that with me, Father Thomas said with warmth in his eyes before they instantly dropped back to a pure, business-like demeanor. But know this, hell isn't all physical tortures. Oh no, my child. Hell is an abattoir of punishments, a screaming din of inequity brought forth by increasingly creative demons, including those of your mind. The halls of hell reverberate with the cacophony of agony and anguish from souls that have no hope for redemption. No, John, hell is more than pain of the body. Neat, I said, defeated. All the more reason to not book a permanent vacation down there. Lilith, he really knew how to paint a freaking picture. I would do anything to not spend even a second in hell, much less an eternity. Father Thomas nodded as if in satisfaction and said, Let me pray on the matter of our alliance, my son. Meet me at my church tomorrow night for my answer. With that... Father Thomas turned and began walking away, his hands clasped in front of him at his waist. Hey! I called out, stopping him. He turned and I asked, How did you know where to find me? You have some predictable habits, John. Fair enough, but why did you attack me instead of just asking? Did I not come upon you tearing a corpse limb from limb and feeding it to your now dead pets? he called back. My head shot to the river where several reptilian bodies floated lifelessly in the water. My mouth hung open and a tiny wheeze escaped my throat before I cried out, My babies! The shockwave did that deed, my son, but rest assured that it was for the best. Anger and shame at killing my pets interlaced with my words as I called back. And why's that, holy man? Because they had a taste for human flesh, my son. 
He turned and continued walking away before calling over his shoulder. How long before they killed an innocent and father damned your soul? Lilith, damn it, he was right. Plus, he had easily located me by my usual body disposal location. Maybe it was for the best, especially if I was going to start working with the priest. Pretty sure the supernatural community would not approve and might hunt me down. Pretty sure I didn't give a shit either. At over five centuries old, I had accumulated enough energy from the blood of mortals that I was a force to be reckoned with. Every drop added to the well of power, and that well grew deeper as I aged, allowing for more energy to be tapped at will. Though it took an excruciatingly long time to fill an ever-expanding well, drop by drop, with enough time, it could be done. And one thing I had was time. What's my point, you may ask? Well, if they wanted to come for me they were going to need a bigger boat. Hey! I had to yell this time, as he was barely visible in the distance. How will I know which one is your church? Silence was his answer, prompting a scowl to crease my face. Damn cryptic holy man! I whispered to myself as he disappeared into the darkness. The Preternatural Chronicles will be a 13-novel series, with Deliverance, the novella, taking place immediately before Book 1, I'm Glad You're Dead, followed by Dawn and Quartered, and Shadow of a Doubt. Book 3 came in about the size of Books 1 and 2 put together, and is epic. As of December 2019, Hunter is simultaneously working on Book 4, Mouth of Madness, and his standalone horror book, Moonlight Equilibrium. Go to hunterblain.com and join his mailing list for up-to-date information on the series. And pick up I'm Glad You're Dead on Audible, narrated by the legendary Luke Daniels. Also, Hunter has a message for you. Hello there, and welcome to my world. If you were listening to this, you probably came across a description somewhere and thought, meh, nothing else to do, and clicked the link. Little did you know the true story behind this, well, story. It begins with two best friends who grew up together, shaping each other's personalities into the assholes they are today. Well, at least one of them, but I'll get to that momentarily. These two boys, let's call them Hunter and John, were all but inseparable. John excelled at music and being the funniest asshole for miles around, while Hunter dabbled poorly, I might add, in his horrible writings. John respected Hunter's writings as much as I, I mean, Hunter, respected John's musical prowess. One fine day, after reading one of Hunter's horrifically detailed short stories about a serial killer, John asked him to write a story about him. Hell yeah, dude! What do you want to be? Hunter asked with brimming honor. A vampire, John responded with a gleam in his eye. But not one of those sparkly ones. A true badass. Done, Hunter said with a smile and an accompanying high five. No, dude, promise. Promise you'll write and finish a book about me. You are the most prolific writer of our generation, and I would be proud to live on for eternity with your words as my life's blood, he said. Or something like that. I might be paraphrasing a little bit, but you get the gist of it. Hunter agreed never to realize the weight of that promise, until one Sunday morning his mother called, crying. John had died, leaving Hunter without his best friend and doppelganger. Hunter still thinks about that moment to this day, how the morning light crept through the bedroom window while Hunter stared at the ceiling, noticing how the popcorn created jagged shadows. Then everything started to blur as his chest was crushed beneath what he was hearing, each word stacking heavily upon the other until not even sound could escape his throat. Only tears existed in the horrific realization that Hunter had to make some of the hardest phone calls of his life to the circle of friends of which John was the center of. John not only left Hunter, but Valenta as well. There was also Nathaniel and Depweg, who were stricken with the loss of such a beloved character, 
And when all three found out that Hunter was keeping his promise to John and writing a book about him, they each wanted to be a part of that journey. Hunter asked them all what part they would like to play in this urban fantasy eulogy, and each immediately knew what they wanted to be. So, please, as you listen to the story, feel free to laugh. Laugh at the situations John is placed in and his dickish dialogue to those around him. Because John is 100% in this story without alteration, albeit he is a vampire. Laugh and let his memory live on inside the theater of your mind. Thank you sincerely from the bottom of my beating heart for giving John the chance to live again. Hey guys, that was part one of this three-part story, so be sure to check back this coming Friday and Monday for the rest. And I really, really recommend you hop over to Amazon and pick up the official version of this audiobook. Hunter Blaine hired one of my personal audiobook heroes, Luke Daniels. He does an amazing job, and the audiobook is well worth the couple of bucks they're charging. And, of course, before you go, you should make sure to subscribe. That way, you don't forget to listen to the rest of this amazing story. I'm Chris Heron, and that's it for today's Tall Tale TV.